Chapter One, Breaking the Curse. I probably wasn't going to live as long as most people, so I couldn't afford to waste time. They said she was cursed, wondered how she could be a normal kid if she had a disease that could kill her, wondered if she could have a normal childhood, asked what would become of her, asked whether she would die before she made it to high school. When Sonia Sotomayor was only eight years old, she attended Blessed Sacrament Catholic School in the Bronx, in the heart of New York City. All students had to go to daily mass at the church next door. One day in the middle of services, Sonia became woozy. She tried desperately to be quiet and not draw attention to herself. Punishment came to those who misbehaved. But her vision blurred to the point that the brilliant stained glass windows of the church turned yellow and then everything went black. She fainted. She woke to see the nuns looking down at her with concern etched on their faces. Shivering from fright and from the cold water they had splashed on her face, she lay still and waited for her mother to arrive. Selina Sotomayor hurried over from work. The worry about Sonia had already been nagging at her and she knew something might be terribly wrong. Sonia was thirsty all the time and she also suffered from dizzy spills and blurred vision. She often fainted and wet the bed. Her body betrayed her over and over, and she was afraid of losing more control. I was ashamed, Sonia said. Taking her to the hospital to begin a battery of tests frightened both daughter and mother. When a technician pulled out a needle to draw blood, it was bigger and scarier than any Sonia had ever seen before. The thought of that needle being pushed into her arm was worse than the fainting spells. She screamed, no, and jumped up out of the chair and ran. The staff chased her. It was no wonder that she was nicknamed Ahi, hot pepper, by her family because she could never sit still. Quick and always moving, her mother said that even at seven months old, Sonia didn't walk or crawl. She got up and ran. That day at the doctor's office, Sonia, little Ahi, used her speed and agility to escape from the staff and blood tests. Fast as ever, she bolted from the room. She raced through the hallways and once outside, slid under a car and curled into a ball so no one could reach her. For a few moments, she was safe. But then, one of the staff members, she couldn't see who, grabbed hold of her foot and dragged her out from beneath the car. Fear tore through her and she screamed at the top of her lungs. They carried her back into the hospital nonetheless. Her cries continued when they plunged the needle into her arm that day. When the results came in, Sonia's mother sat in the doctor's office while Sonia waited in the hallway. She peeked through the slightly open door. All of a sudden, her mother started sobbing. Her shoulders quaked. The tears frightened Sonia. It was the first time she had ever seen her mother cry. As a nurse who helped others, Selina was a strong woman. She saw the worst of cases, helped the dire in need, and comforted and treated patients who were often incredibly afraid. They relied on her for strength, comfort, and reassurance. When she saw her mother break down that day, Sonia knew the news couldn't be good. A nurse quickly ushered Sonia from the room so her mother and the doctor could talk privately. Sonia feared the worst. Finally, Dr. Fisher, who had been the family doctor for many years, invited her in. The diagnosis? Juvenile diabetes. Sonia had type 1 diabetes and would need daily insulin injections. Diabetes is a disease that prevents a person from being able to process sugar. The cause of type 1 diabetes is unknown, although there does appear to be a genetic factor. Insulin is normally produced naturally in the body to help move sugar from the blood to cells. And when the body doesn't produce it well enough, people can't get the nutrients that they need from the food they eat. Insulin injections become necessary or else the symptoms become severe, like the ones Sonia suffered from, like being thirsty, wetting the bed, having blurry vision, and fainting. If left untreated, even more severe consequences could result. Her mother seemed devastated, but Sonia was relieved to finally know what was wrong. Now they could treat her. Now she could get on with her life. 
Dr. Fisher shared that he also had the disease, although his was type 2 diabetes. Although some of the symptoms are similar, including blurry vision, being thirsty, and needing to urinate often, the pancreas continues to produce insulin, so injections are not typically needed. He reassured her that she could still lead a healthy life if she changed her diet and took her medication. He gave her a sugar-free soda, but after just one sip, Sonia thought it horrible, politely told him, no thank you. When he said her diabetes wasn't so bad, Sonia thought, if it isn't so bad, why is my mommy crying? It was bad enough. In 2016, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation found that more than 3 million Americans had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. But in 1962, not much was known about how to treat the disease, especially when it came to children. Complications could include blindness, heart disease, loss of nerve sensation, potential amputations, losing an arm, leg, or foot, or even dying young. What they did know was that diabetes was going to drastically change Sonia's life. Even though she was afraid, she decided that the more she knew, the better she would be able to take care of herself. She didn't want to lose an arm or a leg. She didn't want to die. Sonia lucked out. Taking into account how frightening it could be for a kid, Dr. Fisher answered her questions directly and without hesitation. He was sympathetic to Sonia's turbulent home life. Her disease could cause more heartache and disruption, stress, and fear. He knew there were problems between her parents and how it affected Sonia and her brother. Her mother was a nurse who worked night shifts, and her father worked as a tool and dye worker in a factory. He also happened to be an alcoholic. Sonia wanted to be brave for herself, her little brother Junior, and her parents, but it wouldn't be easy. Dr. Fisher was kind and thoughtful, but that didn't prepare her for the types of tests she would have to take in the hospital. The doctors wanted to observe her because there was still so much to be learned about her disease. For two weeks, Sonia was hospitalized so they could monitor her. She vowed she wouldn't cry, even though the testing hurt and she felt like a guinea pig. They brought in interns to shatter the doctors. They prodded her, put electrodes on her head, dropped new terms. She had no idea what they were talking about. The grueling process started every day at eight in the morning. A nurse or intern would come in and take some blood. Every half hour, they would prick her fingers for a blood sugar reading. The ordeal was excruciating. After days and days of testing, her fingers and arm were raw and sore. They felt like they were on fire. To escape the pain, Sonia retreated to her favorite pastime, reading. But she regretted the time she was missing at school. The value of education was already ingrained in her brain. Up until her hospital stay, her mother's unspoken rules included never miss work and never miss school, ever. So Sonia knew the hospital stay had to be serious. She was an exceptional student who loved to learn and debate question and seek answers. Without missing, she felt a piece of herself missing too. She read for enjoyment and for learning, for a chance to escape her life and for stories to lift her to far off places. Books did that for her. Dr. Fisher loaned her a book about mythology. In it, she learned of the plight of Greek gods and their many adventures in the vast star-studded skies depths of the oceans, or across the greenest forest-covered lands. With flaws and traits that seemed more relatable than superheroes, she was taken away to faraway worlds. It was unlike any book she had read, and it sustained her for months. The best thing she gleaned from the book of mythology, however, was discovering what her name meant. As a version of Sophia, it meant wisdom. That she embraced. She did like to learn. Her favorite books were Nancy Drew mysteries, though. Seeing herself as a Latina sleuth like Nancy, she was hooked on the adventures. A lover of puzzles, research, and solving problems, Sonia was confident and determined that she would make a pretty good policeman or detective someday. She let the dream simmer in her head, getting her through the worst of times. Her mother came to visit her in the hospital every day, always bearing gifts coloring books, puzzles, and once a comic book 
which made Sonia especially happy, at least for a while. Despite the short escapes, the reality of the painful testing broke her spirit. The last day of the two week long hospital stay started like all the others. Her arm and fingers were already burning and she ached like she never had before. She made it until 10 o'clock, but when she saw them lining up the instruments yet again with the threat of another round of casual torture, she lost it. Something inside of me broke, Sonia explained later. After all those days of being brave and holding it in, I started crying. And once I started, I couldn't stop. Her mother burst into the room, took Sonia into her arms and shielded her, protecting her from those seen and unseen forces in the room. She held the terrified and sobbing Sonia. Sonia felt like a cub with her protective lioness mother. Fiercer than ever, her mother yelled, enough, we stop now, she's done. She said it in a way that nobody, not the lab technician standing there with the syringe in his hand, not any doctor in Jacoby Medical Center was going to argue with her, Sonia remembered. Dr. Fisher referred Sonia and her family to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, a cutting edge facility for research and treatment that ran a pediatric diabetes clinic. It was located at the Jacoby Medical Center, which thankfully was in the Bronx, but still a subway ride and bus ride from their home in the Bronxdale Houses public housing. Staff taught children how to live with diabetes, learning good nutrition, being aware of their bodies, and recognizing warning signs when blood sugar fell. Sonia needed daily injections of insulin. Every day she weighed in, took urine samples, and got blood tests. She started to feel like a guinea pig. Worse was the irony of wasting hours and hours in the waiting room at the clinic. She said, did it ever occur to anyone at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine that kids who might not have long to live shouldn't have to wait for endless hours with nothing to read but stacks of old highlights? Her wry sense of humor and keen sense of observation helped her make the best of her situation. But before long, her pancreas was not producing any insulin at all. If she didn't take her shots, the results would soon be fatal. Her mother came to the rescue. It helped that she was a nurse, but she also acted like a guardian angel watching over her daughter. With the nursing background, she helped Sonia research diabetes. The more Sonia knew, the more she could take control of her own life and become vigilant and independent. She also better understood the reality and myths surrounding the disease. True, Sonia had to eat on a strict schedule, but she could actually eat some sweets and could dismiss warnings from her aunts that weren't true, like how eating mangoes could kill her. Not true. She and her mom would often share a piece of cheesecake from the hospital, but only once in a while. If she overdid it and her sugar spiked, she didn't like how sick she could feel afterward. It felt like a thousand pound barbell dropped on her lap. The heaviness made her feel like she was moving in slow motion, every movement and effort making her dizzy and clammy. So although she and her mother learned about diabetes and her mother helped, but it had not started that way. Sonia's condition initially affected her home life in negative ways, proving difficult not only for her, but for her parents, her brother and extended family as well. She needed shots every day. They didn't quite know how to help or treat her. Already the situation at home was strained, mostly because of her father's own affliction with alcohol. Her parents often fought and now they began fighting over who would give her the shots. They fought about how to give her the shots and whose responsibility it was. Someone had to give her the injections. That fact made a turbulent situation even worse. When her mother worked night shifts and weekends at Prospect Hospital, her father tried his best to give the insulin shots, but sometimes his hands shook so badly that Sonia was afraid he would jab her and cause more pain than necessary. Her abuelita, her grandmother, her father's mother, whom Sonia idolized, was convinced she was cursed. She blamed the curse on Sonia's mother's side of the family, yet she comforted Sonia and tried healing her with herbs and teas brought from the riches of their homeland, Puerto Rico. The concoctions didn't work. Sonia refu refused to be cursed. Although she respected her grandmother's traditions and visions, 
Sonia began to assess her own capabilities. She needed a dose of reality. The reality was that she had a disease. Her belief was that she could gather knowledge and information at her fingertips. If her parents or abuelita couldn't give her the dreaded shots, the result would be that her weekly sleepovers at abuelita's would end. She wasn't about to give up her time with her beloved grandmother. They were like two peas in a pod, and Sonia liked to think she was the favorite grandchild. One night, while Sonia stood in the kitchen waiting for her parents to finish fighting and give her the injection, she couldn't take her parents screaming any longer. It was worse than the verdict of being diagnosed. It saddened her to think she was adding to their misery and conflict. Already headstrong and confident, and because she didn't want to be the cause of any more friction between her parents, Sonia decided to take matters into her own hands. She'd had enough. She dragged a chair to the stove and hopped on it to be able to see the top of the stove. As she studied the burners and knobs, her mother came in and asked what she was doing. Sonia calmly told her she needed to learn how to sterilize the needle because she wanted to do it herself. Her mother told her she would burn the house down. Then she saw Sonia was serious. That was a lot to ask of an eight-year-old, but if Sonia didn't do it, who would? She wanted as normal a life as she could get. That day, she took control of her destiny and faced the truth. Her parents wouldn't always be able to help her. She needed to help herself because she didn't want to rely on anyone else. And with that, Sonia's mother taught her all she needed to know about the process. Early every morning, Sonia dragged the chair over to the stove, boiled water, and sterilized her needles. She gave herself injections up to four times a day. Also, to get a blood sugar reading, she cut a sliver into her fingertips using a razor blade. At first, the process was overwhelming. All the things that you have to do and pay attention to can seem much more than you're capable of. Then everything becomes second nature very quickly. It's not so tough after a little while, Sonia said later. Embarrassed by her disease and not wanting to be defined by it, Sonia kept her diabetes secret from everyone else. She didn't want pity. I didn't want people to think that I was damaged, unclean. But one day at a party, she suffered a severe sugar low and her friends grew concerned. That's when she realized her secret could be dangerous. And it wasn't fair when the people she loved most didn't know a vital part of her life and how they could help her. So bit by bit, she started to share her secret with more and more people. The routine set her on a powerful path, allowing her to be proactive, to face fear, to be focused, and to go after what she wanted because she felt her time on earth might be limited. The grim reality of the disease, that she could die any time from complications, still shadowed Sonia. That's when she understood why her mother had cried and her family saw the diagnosis as tragic. Sonia wasn't willing to succumb to those fears and limitations. Determined to live a normal life, Sonia jumped into adventures and took risks. She studied hard and played hard. She thrived by setting goals that she reached one by one. She explored New York with her cousins, stood up to bullies who terrorized her brother, took dance and piano lessons. Her imagination grew too. Reading Nancy Drew novels made her dream about picking up cases and solving them like Nancy did. Nancy's father was a lawyer who discussed cases with her. He'd give her tips to solve crimes. Sonia wanted that life and believed she had the very personality and skills she needed. I was convinced I would make an excellent detective as a keen observer and listener. I picked up on clues, figured things out logically, and enjoyed puzzles. I loved the clear, focused feeling that came when I concentrated on solving a problem and everything else faded out and I could be brave when I needed to be. One day at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, she read a pamphlet about jobs diabetics could and couldn't have. She could be a doctor, a lawyer, an architect, an engineer, a nurse, and a teacher. But what made her pay attention was the list of professions that were out of bounds for diabetics. The list started off with airline pilot and bus driver, she thought that was fair because someone who might pass out and faint shouldn't attempt to fly a plane or drive a bus and put others at risk. Next came the military. 
Her cousin Alfred had put her and Junior through his own type of boot camp, so she had no desire to pursue that type of career. Next on the list was police officer. That stopped her. If she couldn't be a police officer, then that meant she couldn't be a detective like Nancy Drew. There had to be a mistake. She had all the traits of a successful detective, and they weren't enough. I had to go to Plan B, she thought. Plan B came by watching the television show Perry Mason every Thursday night. It introduced her to the career of lawyering. She didn't know any lawyers, hardly anyone she knew went to college, but what was important was that lawyers weren't restricted by diabetes. If they could persecute, prosecute, or defend, and do their job well, that's what mattered. Sonia devoured the show, challenged by the new vocabulary. The courtroom and process to seek justice fascinated her. It was a place where people made a difference. The characters were convincing. As a defense attorney, Perry Mason untangled the stories behind the crimes, but she liked the prosecutor in the show too. Los Angeles District Attorney Hamilton Berger thought it was more important to find the truth rather than win the case. He believed that if a defendant was truly innocent and the case was dismissed, then he had done his job because justice had been served. Most of all, the judge fascinated Sonia. He was the personification of justice and his decision was the case was the final word. Court proceedings were like a complex game of finding clues and solving mysteries, highlighting ethical themes of what is right and wrong. She decided she would be either a lawyer or a judge. She didn't know much about either, but she thought both careers might be possible if she worked hard enough. Like a fearless warrior, she became determined to move toward that goal. Sonia believed what she learned from living with diabetes could actually help her reach her goal. She learned discipline and internal awareness and developed a sense of optimism, risk-taking, and the awareness that she could ask for help. Discipline helped her manage her time better. While she waited for the water to boil and the needles to get sterilized, she would brush her teeth, tidy up, and get dressed for school. Later, she was able to apply this discipline to her studies, which made her more likely to achieve the goals she pursued. Internal awareness meant paying attention to her body and keeping track of when she was getting sick. The most accurate measure was monitoring her body reactions and sensations. Training herself to be super vigilant helped her feel better because she was in control of her own well-being. This mindfulness and awareness made her more in tune to others, too. Dr. Elsa Paulson at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine opened Sonia's eyes to much more than diabetes. Dr. Paulson was the first woman in an authority position Sonia had ever met. Prior to that, Sonia had only seen the nurses and nurse supervisors at Prospect Hospital where her mom worked and the nuns at Blessed Sacrament who wielded power over the students but always deferred to the priests. Watching staff come to attention when Dr. Paulson walked into a room was impressive. Her bedside manner, her way of talking directly to Sonia and not just to her mother and her genuine care for her gave Sonia a picture of yet another possibility in life, that women could aspire to positions of authority and prestige and still be fair and kind and make a difference. Sonia rather liked learning from Dr. Paulson. Realistic as well as optimistic, Sonia considered her lot in life and how she could react to her disease as either a daily awareness or a limitation. She often considered herself better off than her cousin Elaine, who was born with a paralyzed arm. Elaine's mother hovered too much, limiting Elaine's potential and capabilities. As a result, she always stayed at the edge of the playground, never able to set foot inside, always watching children play and run in the sand and through the swings. Sonia didn't want to live that way. Despite her family's fatalistic view of diabetes, Sonia didn't want to be treated like Elaine, like she was too fragile. She had too much to do. She decided to live and work as though she simply had no time to lose because, as she figured, she didn't. That's when she dedicated her heart and mind to school. She never wanted to miss a day. She didn't waste any more time. Diabetes wasn't going to hold her back. She could break the curse. 
Studying hard for years didn't scare her now. She might not be able to become a police officer or a detective, but she wasn't going to let it stop her from pursuing her new dream, practicing law. She was going to be a Latina Perry Mason.